is. Okay, ready? Yeah. Are we recording? Yeah, it's recording. Oh, fucking fierce. Welcome to You Good Sis. You Good Sis? Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to another episode of You Good Sis. I am Kayla. I am Alexia. Alexia, how are you doing? I am doing, it's on the positive side of ish. Yeah. Ish of. It feels like a, like a days of a day. What are days? What is time? Right. What? What time am I taking naps? I don't know. I just take them. <laughs> um, so yeah, days, but good. Like, I'm not mad about it. Yeah. How about you? You good? Uh, uh, whew, another week of I am not, but that's okay. I am here. Um, I just happen to be going through stuff, which you know, because you're my roommate and very close friend. So you obviously know what's going on in my life. But yeah, I'm showing up. Um, saying that I'm not okay, accepting that that is okay, loving crying right now, <laughs> love not cutting them off, which is something that my therapist called me out on. She was, cause I used to just be like, yeah, I was crying and I tried to hurry up and stop it. And, and she's like, just do it. And it feels so cathartic. Yeah. So that's the good and, um, and the sadness, I guess. But yeah. other than that, we here for a second episode. I can't believe we are back again. It feels so good. Doing the thing. It's not the same. It's the, I don't think it's the same not okay as last week because you have different conclusions now. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, we're here. We're here to, uh, once again, explore what's going on out there, what's going on in here, what we are and are not going to do about it when we act, when we rest, mm-hmm. when we just simply take time to feel it. Like you said, just do it. Sit in it. Um, once again, plenty going on out there. Plenty. <sighs> so, yeah, let's get into it with the first segment. Ain't that um, Ain't that um tagging these these headlines with something a little more familiar. Um, I want to start with a story out of the city in which I was born, Washington, okay. D.C. Um, I've seen a lot of, not even headlines, which is part of the problem. Um, some headlines, but mostly tweets from people I know about uh, protests in the new Black Lives Matter plaza just outside of the White House. Mm-hmm. Um, when Black Lives Matter Plaza was named and painted, a lot of the uh, leading voices and, and activists I know in the area were like, that's cute. What a great performance. Bravo. Right. Um, not buying it. Don't right. believe it. Great show. Um, yeah, great show. And uh, they have a supporting cast of the Metropolitan Police Department, as we expected. Um, so I've seen plenty of videos, uh, uh, largely of, of black young black women, getting, you know, in the face of everything, this one girl, you know, sometimes you see uh, protesters ask allies to stand front lines because uh, police are less likely to be agitated by the presence of the allies. Um, But there was a black woman that I saw her speak about wearing goggles, and she was like, I had goggles on, so I got up there because it still stung around my eyes when they tear gassed me, but I had my goggles, and what? And uh, plenty of videos of of after a certain point, you just see the MPD mobilize and shake shit up. Um, I, one of my, one of my good friends from home who works largely as like a healer and you know just very very centered she's kind of to me in my heart like a black lives matter fairy godmother yes. she's just, there's such a light about everything she Love. does like she'll give you a, a, a lavender spray bath and then twerk on stage with frida like yeah, just, <laughs> she's oh that's your friend yeah erica yeah. so erica totten who uh runs to live unchained which is a brilliant healing space for for especially black women interested in finding something she does events throughout the week um, okay. so yeah follow to live unchained on everything and uh she tweeted hi um mpd metropolitan police department beat and pepper sprayed protesters mostly black women in dc last night this was a night or two ago um yes Mayor Bowser, the police are beating black people's ass up and down Black Lives Matter Plaza, just like you knew they would. Yeah. Um, and being the the space provider she is, a lot of these people then look to her in the middle of the night for somewhere to rest and, and heal and recuperate. Um, and this, uh, I knew I wanted to use uh, Toni Morrison something, because love her, also Howard alumna, 
And I found a quote from Beloved that, uh, yeah. I mean, right here we have the source of self-regard because my copy of Beloved is at my mother's house. But um, she and Beloved, Toni Morrison writes, me and you, we got more yesterday than anybody. We need some kind of tomorrow. And I pulled that specifically because of the black women who are in videos because the stakes, the experience, the perspective is different. And these women, though, though we've been saying like black people rest, heal, like the allies can take the reins. We've, we've been doing this for centuries. Right. Um, the black women in DC are like, and y'all still need some of this energy too. Yeah. And hopping in there because uh, that, that yesterday that we have and to the tomorrow that they're fighting for uh, is just so present. Will um, you say that quote again? again? Yes. It says, me and you, we got more yesterday than anybody. We need some kind of tomorrow. And she gave us a dramatic reading. <laughs> Go, girl. She's a dramatic reading. And it hit twice. She's, <laughs> she's a dramatic beat. Yes. And it hit twice. Yes, yes, yes. Um, How about you? What's going on? You're absolutely right. There are not enough headlines about that because I've totally missed that yeah. somehow. I saw something from NBC Washington uh -huh. and they they spoke about how the protesters are like trying to circle and and dismantle the statue of Andrew ja Jackson that's close to, which uh, musical theater reference, bloody, bloody Andrew ja Jackson. Like it's no secret that he was on some other shit. Um, and you just see the, a distance between the protesters and the police, and it looks like they just, an alarm went off, and they're like, okay, time to stand up and fuck shit up, and the officers just, like, stand and are ready with, to, like, arm the shields, and I'm like, what? I, what? What about this clearly trifling, like, not only black people know right. that this man is trifling. Yeah. You just want to protect that so much, you're willing to attack the living civilians yeah. who you we thought we're under oath to serve. I mean, just abolish the whole thing. That's my opinion. Yeah, it's a mess. Um, we're we're going to talk about voter suppression in Kentucky, obviously. Um, Kentucky is my home state. I am from Louisville. I have not, I honestly, have not spoken out much on uh, Breonna Taylor and everything. I mean, besides, we definitely stand by the message we said last week. Um, but I haven't publicly spoken much on Breonna Taylor just because it is really hard to wrap my head around that being my hometown. And I'm sure more people feel that way about all these stories coming out of their hometowns. Anyway, the latest in Louisville, Kentucky news, um, they keep saying it's Jefferson County, but that is Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, they, uh, how do I say this? They, they cut down the number of polling places, quote unquote, due to COVID-19, but then that left one polling place for uh, 616,000 black people to vote at. And they act like the, the way these articles are being um, framed makes it sound like this is just a random place, Kentucky. I mean, Louisville is one of the largest, it is, <laughs> maybe, honestly, but it's one of the largest cities in Kentucky. And to see something like this happen, it's uh, disrespectful. <laughs> at the at the very least yeah. it's highly disrespectful um just to throw out conspiracy theories we both didn't receive our absentee ballots so i'm just like what is going on i got on? my ballot two weeks after it's wild the i got a, ballots closed i got here. a text from the kentucky election department or whatever that was like reminder to send in your absentee in three days and i was like oh, I, <laughs> I didn't even get my ballot <laughs> And it was too late. Um, so please, please go vote on our behalf, because what the fuck. Uh, but my <laughs> my uh, association for this and all that I could think of is just the, the uh, what has now become a haunting song of my old Kentucky home. It's just like my personal connection to Kentucky. I absolutely love it. I think it's so beautiful. When I go home, it feels restful. And that's even outside of my home like my parents home because that's not even the house I grew up in so I don't even have like what feels like true roots when I return to home but Kentucky Louisville that is my home and I'm highly disappointed I'm highly um uh yeah I, I I'm disappointed that is the word to be uh from there and uh the beauty of it though is it's really putting a highlight on everything that I had to, or not had to deal with growing up, because I don't want to make it sound like I went through a bunch, and maybe I did and just didn't notice it, but I definitely wasn't aware, and it's just putting a highlight back on all these things that I was like, 
oh, okay, I'm a token black girl in Kentucky. These are the things that are natural. These are the things I'm aware of. These are the things I'm not. But now I'm hyper aware. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm very disappointed in this headline. And fact checking, I got that from CourierJournal.com, which is my hometown newspaper. What up? They featured me last year. Yo, Courier <laughs> Journal. <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm very disappointed and that's that. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm very grateful for and proud of the voters who stayed. Yes. Um, even the ones who got exhausted, the ones who showed up, period. But especially the ones who stayed and did not move from those doors and banged on those doors while people were submitting paperwork to get the time extended because of the ridiculousness of, of the, con the, con the confines of time right. in which they were trying to get all these people to vote. I saw this video of an 18-year-old voting with her mom, and the mom was like near tears explaining how long they had been here and why. And she was like, this yes. is my daughter's first time voting. It shouldn't be this hard. Daughter, I stand for her, whomever she is. She's standing next to her mom ready she ready to go she ready to go press some buttons and vote her vote she was like it shouldn't be this hard you know it shouldn't she be. is she gen z she gen z yes <laughs> she said she heard her mom's crying she's like look at my mom shouldn't be this hard i'm like go on this is a gen z go on episode. daughter i love it this yeah. is a gen z stand episode we, for sure we love them um a bit confused but mostly love them. <laughs> um uh, another story that i got off of uh, my instagram fierce i know um, My main source of news. Right. Uh, but this this is actually taking place on Instagram. We have Erin Lang, whose uh, pronouns are she, her, hers. Mm -hmm. um, she is a black Ohio-born consultant, writer, public speaker, and media personality. Got that list from her own website. Um, her primary focuses are champ championing, that's the word, uh, social, economic, and the political well-being of the transgender community, specifically the needs of black transgender women. And uh, on Anne Hathaway's Instagram, uh, she had a little IGTV video wherein she apologized for quoting something from Aaron's page or, mm -hmm. or using something from Aaron's page and not... Uh, not what's the word crediting her crediting oh her. interesting yeah and so she was like you know I, I found this information so interesting i was so excited about it i didn't credit her and she's like you know a lot of the work right now is learning how to be an active ally so she was asking the question like how do i apologize and do something about it and she's like you know what i'm gonna remove myself from this situation hmm. and she said this is erin lang who booped her in on the Zoom call for IGTV and said, Erin Lang will be taking my Instagram over for the next week. So wow. what you get in the next week from Anne Hathaway's page is going to be from this black transgender woman's voice, this black woman's voice, um, which I thought was, uh, I mean, I love what I get to continue to love my faves that don't yeah. look like me in times like yeah. this. Like, Anne Hathaway is just giving us so much. <laughs> and for, I, I said to a peer recently in, in an acting setting um, who was afraid to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, they're a white ally. And I was like, listen, nobody knows what the hell they're doing. Some people are more informed than others. And I said, but if you try, from a genuine place and are corrected, you're more likely to act on that correction and do better. Yeah. But if you don't do anything at all, now you're part of the problem still. Um, so I, allies in action are the only ones I talk about. I do appreciate that and I'm excited to see what Erin Lang has to say. Follow her both on Anne's page and on her own page. Um, her name is spelled A-A-R-Y-N, last name L-A-N-G. Mm -hmm. And the song, this is going to be mostly songs this week, <laughs> the song that I'm pulling for this one is Shut Up and Drive by Rihanna. <gasps> I was looking for a job, so it's kind of kind of today. Don't know the words until we get to the chorus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I think I think it's poetic in a, in a way because the lyrics are, you got the keys, so shut up and drive. It's like, okay, allies, you have the keys, you have the privilege. Come on, you she's have, a poet. You got, <laughs> feeling inspired. <laughs> Um, but you, yeah, you have the keys, you have the privilege, you are getting the perspective, you are getting the knowledge. Uh -huh. Shut up, stop the, with the lip service and drive, do mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll, with the energy of Alyssa Edwards. With the, ener <laughs> the energy of Alyssa Edwards. <laughs> if I could pull off a good lip pop, like right on cue, I would have done it right there. 
Hey! Uh, yeah. Shut up and drive. Out of the lip service, the, the, the sharing things that you're not... I mean, sharing things helps. It definitely does. But the, the lip service, mostly. Like, do, do something. Definitely. Do something. Conversations are important, too, but charge them. Focus them. Also, while we're talking about Rihanna, uh, uh, buy black Fenty Beauty. Come on, Fenty Beauty. <laughs> I don't know. I have a Fenty, I have a Fenty um, liquid foundation, yeah. and I love it. But that's all I can I use to. black-owned eyeshadow to Juvia's place. Um, and speaking of black-owned things, Beyonce.com has an extensive list mm-hmm. of black-owned companies and pages and brands. Uh, yeah. Fierce. While we're talking, honestly... I, Everything is flowing so nicely while we're talking about white allies. <laughs> I'm so excited. I get to talk about my favorite white ally. <laughs> and I guess I didn't realize I had a favorite until just now. <laughs> but, um, but also this week, and very exciting news for me personally, I don't know. I mean, Lexi, you know, I've been a stan of this band since I was I, Middle 12, school. Yeah. 12 years old when my friend Alex introduced me to this band and I thought she was the coolest thing because she knew so much about herself already yeah. and maybe that's where my journey and self-awareness started but I was like what do you mean we are 12 you're bipolar I love it um, but uh, she introduced me to Panic at the Disco and this week Brendan Yuri. Uh, the lead singer of Panic at the Disco, and now the only singer of Panic at the Disco. Um, he is the Panic and the Disco. He is the Panic, and he is at, and he is the, and he is Disco. Um, he tweeted, because I am filling in the pieces for myself, but obviously I assumed that there was a, uh, uh, one of his, one of Panic at the Disco songs was played at a Trump rally. And so Yuck. this week, Brendan Year, who we rarely hear from, tweets, Dear Trump campaign, fuck you, you're not invited, stop playing my song. No thanks, Brendan Yuri Panic at the Disco and Company. <laughs> and I Period. When I saw, stop playing my song. I love that energy. <laughs> like, I love that energy because we, um, it, it would be really easy for him to just like let that go and uh there's no more time for that shit so yeah. like to put it blamely there's no more time for that shit so he uh followed it up with another tweet saying dear everyone else donald trump re- represents nothing we stand for the highest hope we have is voting this monster out in november with the league to um the voting registration and i just appreciate it and so for my art association we're gonna bring it right back to when i was 12 years old Brendan Yuri's very first song came out when uh, uh, a time when we were all just like raging for punk. A lot of converse. Haven't you people of, ever heard of uh, <laughs> closing the goddamn door? We're bringing it right back to I write sins, not tragedies, because yeah. it's just like it is a it is a. Um, and I know we are an explicit podcast now, but my language gets out of control, but I don't care. It is a fuck you to everyone. It is it is almost that youthful rage that yeah. I write sins, not tragedy. Let us have. Um, and so I appreciate it. I appreciate this energy from our white allies every day. I appreciate uh, everything that, yeah, especially, I mean, since the gram is my main source of media, I'm like, I really appreciate all the shit that I'm seeing, at least on my feed, obviously, it's curated to yeah. me, um, but we love it, we love that energy more of that. Super, I mean, I, that was not kind of condescending, I wanted a word after super, and I couldn't find it, so I had to back off, super, <laughs> that didn't go as planned, um, for our little Broadway mentions of the week. I want to point everyone once again to Black Theater United and Mm. Black Women on Broadway and even Broadway Black for a lot of events and and talks and and just moments of conversation that are being hosted on many mediums by these three organizations. Um, And also, shout out to the students and some alum of Boston Conservatory who have really, I saw on Playbill today, mobilized to dismantle a lot of racist actions and and, uh, structures in their program. Uh, Professors recently let go due to things they said and did while while, uh, employed there. Um, And I just saw this is happening, I mean, this is happening in multiple universities for musical theater, but I saw this huge... 
uh, kind of like a manifesto that someone at Syracuse wrote about the same thing, about yeah. how their teachers were treating them, about the history that they've had with obviously everything, all the conversations that we're having right now, but that same history, all these institutions are really getting called out. And even the <laughs> students uh, uh, overseas even, I saw that letter mm -hmm. uh, from Central in London um, that Chris Jungle shared, an alum of the program, and some, I think, current students and mm -hmm. some alum were, you know, like you said, a manifesto, like, yeah. this is what we have experienced very plainly, and this is what we won't deal with, and that's the period. What are you going to do about it? So fierce. Because do something about I'd it. I'd love to see one come out from my school. I would love to. This is another point where I, I mentioned yesterday, like, uh, just realizing, especially right now, how even strange my experience is, because I went to an HBCU. I studied theater Which at an HBCU. Unique. Yeah. It's a unique experience. And, and I'm like, wow. I mean, there were definitely some struggles and hurdles <laughs> there. Um, but I love my school. And But one of the things I didn't have to deal with was that. Yeah. I mean, race, racism is internalized and manifests in the Definitely. behavior of, of a lot of even black people. Um, and we do have some, some instructors who aren't black, but it just, just, it's very, very different experience. Very different. Um, definitely other things to heal from. Well, because, it, and two, I would say uh, the, the main difference is that people just have to be conscious. There are enough yeah. Uh, black people or people of color around for people to go, oh, this might be a stupid thing to do or say. Yeah. And that's something that at most of these institutions where you have these musical theater programs, they don't have to think about that because they're just trying to fill a slot, a stock character type, whatever it is. And, you know, we and don't one thing I realized that was very, uh, uh, what's the word I want to use? That's very tricky about studying a uh, musical theater and such a specialized degree program in the BFA program at Howard is that this is an HBCU and at an HBCU you're inviting people across the diaspora and all of the trauma that entails to come create things. <laughs> I love when Lexi uses the word diaspora. It's one of my favorite words. <laughs> uh, but like it's, that is a very charged environment. Yeah. Um, so you know a lot of things unfold from, from that but just not the same as these these things I've seen being written in these manifestos and even uh, as someone who considered grad school at one point just listening to other black students I'm like wow I would really love to further my education in a formal setting but I do not want to do that yeah and one of my peers uh, who was who was currently in a, in a grad program he was like because he's Howard alum as well he was like uh, I want you to realize something it's not going to be the same at all. No program at all. There's no HBCU with MFA in acting right now. Right now. Um, so he's, he was like, it's going to be different. And I was like, you know what? I think I learned where I did on with such purpose. Mm -hmm. that I'm not, I don't know if I want to put myself in. Yeah, you don't want to unlearn that behavior. No, not even unlearn it, but it's, I don't want to spend my graduate experience fighting against the other behavior, trying yeah. to teach people or teach my professors not to speak to me that way. I can teach you to speak not to speak to me that way on some different things, but yeah. race, that's not going to be one. Well, especially as, I mean, the grown-ass woman you are now. You know what I mean? Like, we were talking about, even this morning, uh, how I just, I, I didn't have the knowledge that I have now. I would I would just straight up call it woke. I just wasn't woke when I was in school. I lived in, I mean, <laughs> I lived in Louisville, Kentucky as a token for my whole life. Um, but now, now that we have this, uh, now that I have this kind of knowledge, if I went back to school now, y'all couldn't touch me. You know what I mean? Like, the stuff that I look back on, and it's not that I was abused. It's not that people were, you know, I mean, it's just white people who have not been taught, um, or, or black people have not been taught, honestly. I mean, anyone. Anyone has not been taught. But uh, if, I, if I went back with the knowledge that I have now, oh, the they would have to kick me out. Yeah. Because I was, uh, one of my other friends who's currently in grad school, I was like, you can feel however you want to feel about your undergraduate experience. And I said, but one thing that we won't do, that a Howard grad won't do, is be in a space and be talked too crazy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we can stop right now. Um, because you've got me fucked up. I can tell you professionally. I also don't have to. I will likely tell you professionally. But I, I don't know. Yeah. People are different, you know, different strokes, different yeah. folks, different attitudes, but I don't know of a HU Theater Arts grad that would, you know, I, the ones I know who are in programs now that are mostly white spaces, their stories are saying, I had to fight against this and now the students under me don't have to deal with that. 
or it's like I had to fight against this and I reached out to the black students who had graduated before me and they were like oh yeah me too and yeah. I'm like so what are we gonna do about it that energy I'd rather use for my my a repetition yeah and Alexander's technique but I definitely uh congratulate Boca Boston Conservatory for getting that kind of yeah uh, recognition for making their voices that loud because mm -hmm. there have been problems with these, especially these top league musical theater schools. I mean, they have, they've had a reputation. We've all been aware. And I think we are all just like, that's the field you choose. That's the position you put yourself in, whatever. No, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm in every segment with the same phrase. It's not that time. It's, not that <laughs> it's just something. I guess too, while we're here, I just want to like, I, I was divi d dividing. <laughs> Kentucky words. Oh, Kentucky. Um, I was debating whether, whether to say this or not. But um, Hamilton is coming to Disney Plus June July 3rd. Or July 3rd. Yeah, we're in June. Duh. Um, watch some uh, work made by people of color yeah. and appreciate those people because it really is. I mean, we've had time to sit with it and process it, and we know it's a work of genius, but it really is a work of genius. So yeah, just the go. original cast. Huge. Um, and, yeah, we can... Roll right on out of that. Moving into who all gonna be there? Do you wanna take a breath? I feel like you. <laughs> we definitely wanna take a breath because we have to set up the Zoom call. I but. think we should. This is talking. Yes. I think we should. Um, like you know how when in in the read it sounds like they literally took a break and then they, she comes back and she's like, okay, now we're gonna move into like I feel like we could have those little like look how we're on business meeting over. <laughs> if I do keep this in the edit, then shout out to the read, because uh, we just mentioned them. But yeah. Shout out to the read. Um, uh, yeah, who are going to be there? Before we move on, I do want to talk about that time we spoke to Kid Fury and Crystal, and they asked if we would, if we wanted to eat with them after the show, and we said no, because you were tired and I was about to pass out. Oh my god. We said no. We said no. And we even got offered Crown Royal. I mean, yeah. it was a wild experience. Lexi and I took ourselves on a date to go see The Read live here in Harlem at the Apollo. I mean, such seven a... Seven years. Oh, seven year anniversary. Such an easy trip. And we, through magical circumstances and friends, made it backstage. And then they invited... I mean, Crystal was literally like, have some Red crown, Rooster. have some what? They invited us to Red Rooster. And we said no. No. We said no. Like idiots. Y'all can unfollow us right now. But listen, now. But that's, <laughs> that that's self-care, though, because I was exhausted. I, I would have embarrassed myself at that table <laughs> because I would have fallen asleep yeah. in the spinach and artichoke dip. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, moving on. Who are all going to be there? And today we have Candace Marie Woods, an, an actor, singer, dancer, um, one of our old castmates and friend who agreed to speak with us today. So please hold for the technical. All right. Hi. <laughs> Candace! We have Candace. Hi, hi. Um, yeah, today, today on the podcast, we have Candace Marie Woods. Uh, we met Candace four, three, three years ago. Three Wait, years five. ago. In uh, Seoul, South Korea, doing our little production of Dream Girls that we foolishly thought was going to tour. <laughs> Candice Marie Woods, whose career on the Broadway stage started at 17. Yeah. 17. Candice said the contract was signed when she was 17, but the, the production started at 18. And I said, well, the ink dried at 17. <laughs> and that's the career. Right? And that was like, had you, had you, had you graduated high school at the time? Um, no, I, I graduated about two months after I started, or a month after I started uh, on Broadway. Um, but I just finished, and we had two serious classes left, so I just finished that while I was rehearsing for the show, and it wasn't anything. One of my teachers was like, just write a book, or write, write a book, just write a book. <laughs> write an essay, write an essay on one of your favorite books, which was Their Eyes Are Watching God. Ha, ha, ha. And then the other teacher was like, oh, no, you have to take the exam. You have to do all this stuff, all this prep. And I was just like, okay, whatever. So basically, I literally only had one, one real class that I had to, like, focus on. But the dream. everybody else was like, go be a singer. I will be 
so funny because when I was 17, I told my parents I was moving to New York and they said, you're not. And that was the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't looking dry yet. No, that was the end shit. I didn't have the contract like Candace <laughs> So after Hairspray, we had Hot Wood, so many other shows. We have uh, uh, Legal, Legally Blonde, we have uh, Catch, Me Catch Me If You Can, Can. we have The Book of Mormon, we have I'm Missing Things. There are many things in between. Um, yeah. Before the world shut down for us to spend time with ourselves in the state of the world, Candace was uh, playing Diana Ross in Ain't Too Proud. On Broadway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and still is. I mean, yeah, remains, I mean, remains. Um, when, how long have you been home? You're home in Texas right now? Yeah, I've, I've been, been in home. Texas for about a month. Um, and I was planning on coming back to New York. And every time I, like, get the urge to come back, I'll hear something about something that's going to make me lose my mind, like fireworks or you know, people getting run over by police or just like all kinds of noise and mess that I, I initially left New York because I just, it wasn't um, sitting right in my spirit. To be honest, I just couldn't handle, um, I tried, I thought I was a hard knock, but <laughs> then I was like, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. I gotta get somewhere with it. A little safer, um, quieter, um, and closer to my family. So, yeah. yeah. For sure. I definitely relate to that. As soon, I mean, as soon as we started the shutdown and my rehearsals got canceled, I three days later was out of here because I just was like, how can one person take it mentally? Luckily, Lexi was strong enough, but I definitely relate. Hey, I'm not going to lie. I definitely was in like a, having a moment even before everything shut down where I was having a full on mental breakdown. And I'm not ashamed to say that out loud because it's not something that we should be ashamed to talk about. But I absolutely was having had a full on mental breakdown and had um, told my told the show that I was going to be out for two weeks. And then I never came back because no one came back. So <laughs> then it was just like, OK, great. Then I was able to actually focus on my mental health. Unfortunately, a lot of what's going on is, is testing that. So you know, you just do the, the next best thing. I've also watched Frozen 2 a lot. Uh, still haven't seen that. Do you know, like weeks, a couple of weeks before everything shut down, Kayla and I went to The View to see Issa Rae and Lakeith Sandfield. And <laughs> they gave, uh, like, the goodie bag treat, the swag bag situation was, like, uh -huh. the digital code for Frozen 2. And I was like, what am I going to do with this? Then here, Jason good things about it but then the, the audience the day after us got tickets to janet jackson's concert I said, we were okay okay wait a minute wait a minute <laughs> i i have not i'm not like a frozen fan i didn't really enjoy the first one i loved the second one but come on man not i mean it was unreal but I don't, want, I don't want to take away your joy. I didn't, I didn't know. I, 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 listen, you got to find joy where you can find it. And I just yeah. happened to be randomly watching that with a friend who was like, you have to watch this movie. And I was like, no. And then I was like, oh. <laughs> I think that it, my intuition was just like, run as fast as you can away from everything Times Square and Midtown because yeah. it's about to get crazy. I think, I honestly believe that. My body was just like, no, something's not right. Something's just not right. Yeah. Is that, so is when, before we started this pandemic and we started the shutdown, and you're saying that you were having this kind of mental break leading up to that point, do you think uh, that, like, just kind of the energy is what contributed to your mental breakdown, or did you have contributing factors that you could pinpoint? Oh, I'm I'm super sensitive to energy. I I believe that 100% that we are all connected energy-wise. And so, yeah, I had things going on in my personal life, but I also know that um, just walking around the city, you could feel, I felt weighted. I felt like something was on my back and on my shoulders and then on my chest. And then it was just like all encompassing, like all over my body. And I just, I... <clears throat> I um I knew that like with mental breakdowns there's so many factors that play into it but I wasn't surprised once everything shut down I wasn't surprised by that because I'd already been kind of 
worried about it. I wouldn't say I'm like a hypochondriac where I, I was like, oh my God, we're all going to die. We're all going to get sick and die. Um, but I was more so like something's coming, something feels off in the, in our, in our spiritual realm here. And I, I don't know. I don't know. I guess I'm a, I'm a Pisces. I don't know where I get that from. I, maybe it's our ancestors. I don't know. We, maybe yeah, it's 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 probably probably it because I, again, I keep saying this, I relate. I felt the same thing, but I kind of contributed it to all the change that I was going through in the career and I was in the yeah. hustle and, you know, yeah. rehearsals and blah, blah, blah. But I definitely felt the same kind of weight where I was like, something is it. Yeah. And I was yeah. about to embark on this project. I mean, go, going on this tour, but for something I, and I was speaking to friends about this at the time, I was like, I don't feel like this is happening. I, don't, I just don't feel, it doesn't feel right. So, yeah. and I highly contribute that to energies and how the universe works in our favor. I mean, I could preach on that forever, but I, I definitely relate. Yeah. It's interesting to hear you felt the same. Yeah. I think we, we just be knowing stuff, y'all. Like, it's just one of those things. We, 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 if we, if we could write our own scary movie, it would be one of those things. We'd walk into a situation and immediately know. Yeah. Something's up. We wouldn't just be like, la di da di da di da. I'm like, oh no! It would be like <laughs> that. So you can, I mean, I mean, really fucking fighting the fight on Instagram. And I mean, you're constantly speaking on um, how people can better approach queer people. You're speaking on your queer and black experiences growing up. And it's so. Um, inspiring for me to see and for us to see. That's why we're having you on the show. But I just wanted to, like, in the meantime, what do you do for yourself? How do you take care of yourself and walk yourself through? Because I know there's that phrase, check on your strong friends. <laughs> you know, and Candace, you're the strong friend. But it's just like you're yeah. not this sensitive being. So how do you take care of yourself in this time? I don't, that just sounds like a huge compliment. I don't think... I've ever heard anyone say that, but thanks. Um, <laughs> um, well, recently, I've been really focusing on my breath, um, just taking deep breaths throughout the day, and when I'm, especially when I'm doing stuff like this, having conversations with people about com things that might be a little triggering or just talking in general, um, I take my deep breaths. And then staging saging, listening to, um, you know, music that's calming, taking lots and lots of naps, like I'm a toddler in preschool, like it feels so good to just, like, one of the great things about this too, and, and, and sometimes I'll be feeling a little guilty about it, but it's just the amount of rest I've been getting has been so great, um, and I, I, I love nap time, <laughs> I, love, I, I look forward to, like, you don't have any plans. You may have this to speak on, and you may have, like, something to post tonight, but, like, you have zero plans. Um, rest yourself, my sweet friend. Um, and then just, you know, staying hydrated. You know what I think everybody else is trying to do? Like, yeah. keep, their, keep their wits about them and, um, and allow for the, the depression to come in, like, wel welcome it in when it does. Um, which just been this whole week. I've just been like, oh, hello, friend. Yeah. Hug. <laughs> Let's sit together. Let's just be here. What do you need? Oh, you want some chicken? And you. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. You know, if I just going with the flow is like the only thing that we can do right now. Yeah, it's it's yeah. funny. You're using a lot of the same phrasing that I've been coming up with for myself and when actually when I was in therapy a couple days ago, I said to my therapist, she's like, how are you doing? And I was like, I feel like I am step by step walking a toddler through the day, you know, and this toddler's not taking naps. So it's just like, it was a wild experience. But that is what we've idolized this like idea of self care as it's like, face mask and take a bath and, and sometimes it is that but other yeah. times it literally looks like pacing yourself yeah. hour by hour minute by minute second by second mm -hmm. how do I take care of myself in this moment I remember speaking to my mom and she was like 
how are you doing? And my answer was anxious or worked up or, or whatever. And I knew that as my mother, she wouldn't like that answer. Um, but I was like, it's, it's how I feel. And I was like, but you know what? This is what I'm doing. And also me being dishonest about feeling that way was only going to perpetuate it, was only going to like push it down so that there was too much pressure. And when it came out, it would be like a full episode or a breakdown or anything. And I was like, no, we can, I can just eat, babysit myself. Yeah, and like, I can. Even with eating, I'd have to make my food, turn off the TV, turn off the music, put my phone in a different room and be like, Alexia, you cannot do anything else yeah. until you eat. But it's something that I'm just not learning about is not trying to get over that process and just like sitting in it. And if I start randomly crying, being like, okay, let's yeah. play it out. Well, isn't that what's so beautiful about this time too? I mean, isn't I, I know this time is terrible in so many different ways and like it's, probably one of the reasons people are feeling more depressed but what's so great about it is we get a chance to just sit with it and not feel like we have to go 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 keep running keep running and put masks on and try to pretend to be you know shuck and jive in front of these Broadway audiences you know what I mean so like it, it's, it's actually been really great to like sit with it and not feel that pressure to um, push it back down or because that actually just makes it worse. You're just you're just suffocating yourself with something that needs to be let go and let let it just run through you real quick. You know what I mean? Or however long it takes. Maybe it's two weeks. Maybe it's a month. Maybe it's a few minutes. But it has to just you gotta let it you gotta let it run through you. Yeah, I think people need to be reminded that the counterproductive part is the shutting down. It is not like letting it happen. You know. So that's yeah. and also as these like highly sensitive creative people, um, spending time with it is why we are this way, you know, is why we have the facility to do what we do, how we do it. Like we're impacts. We just become yeah. them. Say so, yeah. yeah. yes. What did 17-year-old Candace love about performing on Broadway that remains true for Candace today? I hadn't thought about it in a while, you know, you just be going, going, going. I hadn't really thought about what that felt like. Um, to 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 be in a show and to have the curtain go up and to sing your first line and to do your first dance move. And the very first thing I ever did on a Broadway stage, every first thing I ever sang or did was Good Morning Baltimore. And yeah. that number in itself was just such a like, huh, you know, like I I felt in that moment, I felt a part of something so huge and so beautiful. And I still keep that with me today. Like that's something that, especially when you're originating a show and when you're opening a show, it's like, it's just magic, man. Broadway magic. And I live for that shit. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know how young your audience is, but I'll, I'll try not to curse as much. Right. In any case, um, yeah, I, that's something I think is always going to stay with me. And it, I think that stays with performers in general, um, hopefully, you know, if, we're, if you're lucky enough to be able to look back on that, you know, why is it that we do what we do? What is it that brings us here? And, you know, obviously the love of performing and, you know, sharing our, sharing my gifts has been um, something that I, I don't take for granted. I am grateful to this day to have had such an incredible opportunity to continue to do this as a job. So, um, cause it's not easy as you know, like it is not easy to stay in this business. It's not easy to, um, take all those hits and that rejection and not let it like completely shatter your entire ego, which, you know, it's, it's challenging. Um, and a lot of those challenges come are for me have been with, um, race issues, just things that, you know, I know my white counterparts have not had to experience. And so the challenging part for me, especially with certain shows I've done, has been this feeling of being alone and feeling like I couldn't really speak out or speak up or do this or do that because I didn't want to become difficult or I didn't want to be seen as, you know, I wanted to be hireable, um, let, let alone, like, aside from my talent and aside from, like, the desire to do it, I always felt an extra bit of pressure to um, almost ascribe to this, you know, this whiteness, the, the great white way in a way that was great and white, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
one second. I mean, yeah, that's so that that's really it. Yeah. yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. I mean, the great white way, that's exactly how I grew up knowing this business. I thought that that's what you had to do. And it wasn't like, a, oh, everyone is super white. So I need to conform to super white. But it was just like, oh, this is what musical theater is. And this is how you get into it. And these are just the things that not have to naturally change. What unfortunately is being addressed now in theater is uh, something that we just always had present on our minds and I think that's what makes the conversation so frustrating is because now we're seeing like these articles of girls whose tights don't match their skin and the band-aids don't match their skin and how, when I was going in for my wig fitting the wig person told me my hair was rough and I didn't know what to do and it's like all these things that we just heard on repeat but we were just conditioned to be like oh that's what we're gonna just deal with mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah all the, it's just Lexis is not whole experience yeah. with, the, with the theater arts and and that's a privilege in a way um, but it also made my move to New York as a theater artist kind of violent because it's like the Broadway I was entering wasn't even the Broadway that I was expecting to enter when I was in college and uh, one of our castmates at Dream Girls was just like Alexia that's not Broadway right now <laughs> like that's not that's not what New York is right now and I was like oh, okay so do you want me to wait till that happens again or like right it's like I, I, I don't want to say that I'm not grateful for those, those opportunities, but that is, it's tough. It's tough to be like, the t okay. <laughs> it's been tough. It was tough to try um, and, and kind of fit in. But I also, I also know that my, you know, semi-professional career was that as well. So I, I was like trained to deal with it. Um, um, but there's nothing like it. I mean, you just, you, you try, you try your hardest to make sure that everybody knows you're, you're good. You're like, you're a good person. You, you belong to be here or is that what I'm, yeah, you belong to be here. Is that the right way to say that sentence? There's space for you here. People. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it was, it was tough. That part was challenging. That part was, um, you know, it had its, 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 its blessings and its curses. Um, For sure. But even in the last uh, few years, I mean, since we all met in Korea, even, I think all of us have explored. Well, <laughs> Lexi, Lexi been freely black as fuck her whole damn life, but, <laughs> but at least like even in our aesthetics, Candace, like we have just become these people, and I wouldn't say different people, but we have become way more comfortable with the people we are, being open about our queerness, being whatever we want to be, wild hair, wild whatever, you know? I've had, I've had all kinds of stuff, green hair, yellow hair, white hair, no hair, all the hair, wigged down, it doesn't matter. I feel like maybe, before, I don't, at least for me back in, in 2017 even, um, it felt like we kind of had to hide that or we had to choose the right moments to bring out those parts of ourselves. Well, remember when we, they didn't have color, like the right color makeup for us? I don't know if y'all experienced that, but that's- Do you remember one of, the, one of our castmates had to teach the hair crew how to crack the wig? I, I, I try not to trash that experience because I had a beautiful experience in playing the role that I always wanted to play my entire life. However, I was just, it just, if you're going to be a show, if you're going to bring black people into your theater, I don't care if it's in South Korea or if it's in Dallas, Texas, like have the things you need. Yeah. for the black people that are going to be there and don't just like throw things at them at the last second because a lot of what we were doing was just thrown at us at the last second and i felt extremely disrespected as a cast as a as a as a black company i felt very much so disrespected and so yeah as y'all know in so many different departments and i speak loudly about that i don't have any shame i why do we need to make other people feel comfortable by being quiet and not expressing our, it's not sharing our real experience. They need to do better. People need to do better, period. Yeah. If I don't feel supported, then this isn't a, a 
balanced relationship and you want me to put my instrument on stage and in the public eye for X, Y, Z and I won't do it. And then talking to, uh, from a production standpoint, reaching out to the more American side of it, when I spoke with them that same week and they didn't know what was going on, I was highly offended and even, and even enraged watching everything unfold as one of the youngest members of the cast, like watching the, the leads and the people who had been doing the thing for so many years, like deal with it a little bit longer. I was pissed because I spoke to the American side of it. And I'm like, I'm sorry, why did you send 25 people, black people to the other side of the world and not address what they needed in order to do the job? I'm yeah. Not well, it was a second thought. They took an entire black cast to Korea and then, and then addressed every single uh, not even issue every single little detail that you may have to encounter with doing such a thing yeah. after the fact. The big thing for me that I knew this was going to be maybe not the best experience was was our needing to hide the historic context of <clears throat> you know the black experience during that time because Koreans didn't experience that so that's not you know it's not it's not necessary to tell this, this part of the story. So we're going to change a few things here. I'm going to throw Elvis into the, into the, I mean, it was like just blatant, like erasure of not only the, the historical context that is the show, but then you are disrespecting the show. This is a black show. You're disrespecting it. You can't, I don't care. Like I said, I don't care if we're in Mars. I don't care if we are in another galaxy right here on this planet, black people have experienced certain things. And if you're going to tell these stories, if you're going to share these stories, you cannot just be for your, for your amusement. It has, you have to be able to look at the pain. You have to be able to see the history of it, learn some shit, try to understand it, and then, and then go, wow, these black people are incredible. We are still thriving, even with all the mess being thrown at us. And we would, whether you bought the ticket or not. Because that was another thing, because all this isn't even just a comment on, you know, because like, like we all said, I, it was a great experience, period. I was going to have a great time, no matter what. But um, a, a comment on... <laughs> Zooming on my face. <laughs> but uh, just not even from a, from a being in Korea and doing the show point of view, but just a capitalistic point of view. There was a point where we all had a, a meeting in the hall, and you were the main voice to say, I'm sorry, you care more about ticket sales than you do about uh, me having a voice when I get back to America. <laughs> or lungs. <laughs> or lungs. <laughs> but, that's, but you know what that is, right? You know that that is the whole idea that, well, this is, well, there are two things. You were hired to, please sit down. That you were hired to do a gig, right? Yes. I know that I'm hired to do this gig, but there's also this, this like underlying, underlying thing. Well, black people can handle it. Black people can, if I scream that this is, I don't feel right or I feel bad, I'm, I'm, they ignore it because black people are considered to be, you know, stronger, especially black, you know, women or black people in general. Um, they're just considered to be stronger. And I, I'm not, I'm not for that. You know, I'm not for that shit either. Like, we've got to stop pretending like when I say that something is wrong with my health, it needs to be taken seriously. It doesn't need to be looked over and get brushed aside like, oh, they're just being difficult and complaining. It's, it's that whole thing of black women are just the diva and we're not allowed to, one, be introverts in the workplace and we're definitely not allowed to have a voice in the workplace. So it's like, where do you find the balance? <laughs> Right. Literally, where do you find the balance? So I guess from here, I just, I, I want to transition and ask you, you are queer, you are POC, you're WOC, you are in this uh, niche market that is hard to get into, Broadway performers. I mean, you represent so much. How do you focus what you want to put your energy into? What do you find gains, gains the most of your, uh, more of your attention? I guess. Well, I mean, I can only, I can only live through my experience. I, I mean, my experience is all I know. I, I'm, I can learn from other people's experiences and I can, I can try to understand different, you know, paradigms and, and see different points of views, which I'm actually really good at because I like, I'm, I'm, I live in the middle. I like to see how everybody is thinking. But um, how I've been doing it really is just 
recently, and this wasn't my entire career, but recently I've been just a little less apologetic about who I am, um, what I have to offer, what my what what I'm what I'm really here for, and I think what I'm here for, and this is just what I've learned recently, is is to speak truth to some of these things that we've been taught um, that are not necessarily uh, benefiting us anymore. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> why not use the platform that you have? Um, I know that some people would look down on that, but before this pandemic was happening, I was given such, I had, I had found my voice, I had found my voice um, in Oakland, California, and I had found love out there, um, and I had also just found myself. And so from here, like from then on out, I had decided that my main goal was to use the gifts that I have, yes, singing, dancing, acting, but also um, speaking, maybe, um, sharing, uh, uh, helping people see, and, and raising, raising that awareness. Um, I don't know. I, I, I can only really base it off of my lived experience. Um, but I know that my lived experience is something that uh, other people share, that other people are sharing with me. Um, you know, sometimes I feel this way and sometimes I feel that way. And, you know, I've been having all these questions about gender and about sex and about, you know, all of the things that we've been taught that ne weren't necessarily, um, you know, true or, or, or fully correct. Um, and I don't know. I just, that's what kind of keeps me going. I don't know. I don't know if that was answering the question. Well, I think that's, that's the, the getcha gotcha of the question is that you just, I mean, you are all of those things at one time. So it's just like, you, you really are just speaking from personal experience. That's all you can do. And obviously all of those things resonate with you. So, I mean, that makes complete sense. And also when you're, when you're specific about, who you are and where you are, what questions you have, what you know, what you don't know. When you're specific about that space, that's when your your voice can resonate more, you know, with the people who connect to it. I think in doing that, like, I'm ushering more people in. I'm calling more people in, especially people who've known me for so long and have watched um, watched me grow up, watched my career. I think, I think they are the ones that I'm really speaking the loudest to because I'm like, you know, you say you are proud of me, you say you support me, you say you love me, but like here I am now being fully me. Um, and, and we as people are ever evolving. So this is not it, I'm not done. Like I'm not, I'm not done. Like I'm still gonna continue to find different things about me that I love and that I maybe don't love. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, I gotta, if, if you can't accept all of me, then please, please unfollow, delete, here because the information that I'm here to share share with you now is not just a red dress and a wig. And now I'm sh I'm here to show you um, that that we we are we are oh God, we are just not black and white. We are not this or that. People in general, we just never have been. And I'm not I'm not interested in that narrative anymore. So like let's let's move on. Let's move forward. And I know that Generation Z is getting. Honey, Generation Z is coming with it. Yeah. Okay, okay, and I was, I, I mentioned this to Kayla yesterday. I said, did you see Candace work with uh, Gen Z to to buy out that rally? I said, yeah. I said did you see what the kids did? Said, they bought the tickets. I said, it was a pop Gen Z and Candace. <laughs> I said, Candace said, I bought two seats at that rally. I actually learned about it through, um, Tamika Lawrence was the one who was like, hey, y'all, we should do this. I was like, okay, girl, I see you. I literally, I was going to post it on my page, but then I was like, mm, let me keep it secret. Yeah, Gen Z put a boot to that door. Dude. And that gives me so much hope to know that the generation coming up is yeah. like, you know, they, they, they have been growing up with just information, constant information all, at all times. They have never had a moment where they weren't able to just click on Google and look something up. So it's like the information overload is actually really good in that they, they, they see the mess. They see it. And they're here to say no more. Like, it stops with this generation. 
Yeah. And it's fair to say even millennials like had kind of a stutter step with that information because yeah. it was not always that rapid. It was yeah. not always that available. <laughs> but for them, it's just, it's, it's a part of the game. It's like second nature. They don't even have to think yeah. about it. I sleep with my phone in another room. <laughs> yeah. I think if you, if you were born into a time where that's so readily available, it's like you're, it's the only experience you have. So it's like they, I know are going to be all about therapy. They're going to need it. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about it. I mean, we all need therapy, let's be real, but information o overload can be bad on your psyche. So, yes, therapy is important, but I, I say knowledge is power. So, yeah. come on, come on with that's it. Rock taught us. I love schoolhouse that's rock. That's what Schoolhouse Rock taught us. What would you say? That's what Schoolhouse Rock taught us, what you just said. <laughs> that little bill sitting on the steps of it. I learned so many yeah. schoolhouse rock and veggie tales. Veggie tales, yes. My sister loves veggie tales. I secretly liked it too when it was playing at church. I'd be like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's cute. Larry. If I thought I was too grown to watch it, I was just, yeah, I was I thought I was too grown. But I was like, <laughs> I'm gonna just <laughs> <laughs> peeking into the nursery, like, what y'all, what y'all watching? <laughs> Well, whenever you uh, make your way back to New York, whenever you feel safe enough, which I don't know how you're going to make that decision, but uh, whenever you feel safe enough, we have to get together. This is so lovely to have this discussion with you. Yes, of course. Thank you for having me all. Like, seriously, you know, I, I'm always down to, to chat and get together and, you know, it's important, so I'm here for it. I, I, I want to mention, um, everyone can't see it if they're, if they're listening and not watching on YouTube, but the YouTube people can see it, but the, the streaming people. Uh, Candace's dog, Charlie, has wanted to be a guest on this segment. <laughs> we have to disclaim it because any inappropriate snickers that happened while you were trying to have a serious conversation I was, <laughs> where I was, Charlie just runs across the screen. <laughs> <because> <laughs> she had runs. things to say. I just was like, girl, we don't ever do this. She's usually so chill. So that's why I was like, oh, she'll be fine. And now she's like, play with me, do all the things. Like, she's looking at me right now. Like, what are she's you doing? Why are you yeah, she's a young activist. She's a part of the conversation. She heard us talking about feelings. So she was like, you need a friend? <laughs> she's a great, I love her so much. That's Charlie B. Follow her on Instagram. No, I'm kidding. No, honestly, plug it. What is her Instagram? <laughs> her, her Instagram is Charlie Billy Baby. See, and then while we're here, Candace, why don't you go ahead and tell everyone your Instagram? Oh, mine is Candub, C-A-N-D-U-B-B-S. Um, yeah, follow me. I have a lot of highlights that talk about trans lives, queer lives, pronouns, um, information that maybe you might not know about or that you aren't getting through your feed because of whatever. So, yeah, check it out. Yeah. And if Broadway ever comes back, we get to see you in that red dress, which is a gift. Yes, if I can fit it. Oh, Lord, help. The chicken. It's the chicken. <laughs> the chicken. <laughs> My waistline is fluctuating weekly. <laughs> I mean, and I'm like, so what are we going to do about it? I'm, I'm not, it's <laughs> not, it's <laughs> not even staying until next year. So I'm just going to be quiet and let my body do what it wants to do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, ladies. Sooner rather than later. Peace and blessings. Stay safe. Bye. Love you. Bye. Love you. You gotta start our work of over. Now, the, welcome to We Are Not Therapists. <laughs> yeah, we are not. Um, Just to repeat, yeah. we are not therapists. Our mental health segment, advice yeah. segment. So, um, yeah, like we said last week, this is usually where we would like to take listener letters, uh, but we also kind of want to morph this space into something a little more open, so we're not just always stuck to listener letters, yeah. and um, just kind of share parts about ourselves when we get the chance, too. So you, what do you want to... So it's really crazy, because we covered a lot of this in talking to Candace. Yeah. I, I wrote in our little outline. I was like, I want to talk about mental health in the workplace as an artist, as a performer. Mm -hmm. I should probably move this mic up. Um, but we covered a lot of that we speaking did. to Candace. But if we want to take a moment, is there any one moment that you remember on a contract where you had to check in and adjust or even learned a lot about your mental health and what you need? 
absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, what stands out to me um, and what I said to Candace earlier is this uh, idea of black women in the workplace are not allowed to be introverts and we are also not allowed to be outspoken for fear of being uh, brash, abrasive, uh, diva, uh, you know, like it, immediately if you have an issue with something and you speak out about it, you're, someone's going to call you a diva. I mean, mm -hmm. just because you're black, like that, that term comes more naturally to black women than it would white women or any, any other person, any other uh, gender, any other whatever. It's black women. And it's, it, it's something that I had to learn. I think that I started to understand why I was uncomfortable in my workplace when I was on um, a very notable long game that I did about a year ago. Uh, and I just felt myself becoming very burnt out it was one it was one of, yeah one of the first times that I had to lead a show and um, navigating that weight along with uh, getting pulled aside in the first week by my stage manager and told that I need to be an example for my cast solely because I was introverted um, and uh, it was it was it was odd. That was the time that I really had to start navigating like, okay, where do I find my voice in this? Because I moved through all of my life, I'd say, um, trying to live up to this bubbly person that I come off as. And I am bubbly, duh. Uh, but <laughs> duh, I am pink, I'm brats, I'm bubbly. Um, but living up to that person all the time was something that I felt like I could not do. And especially when I was at a place where I was like, oh, heightened anxiety, learning new things, taking on new responsibilities. And then I was told that I needed to be uh, represent like <laughs> the representation of somebody's lead or some shit. Uh, it was it was a shit ton of pressure. And what I needed to do, and what I told myself I needed to go do going into that situation, into that contract, was reserve myself. And it's funny because I actually learned this through the leads we had in Dream Girls, mm -hmm. where I watched, you know, everyone, some people had open doors, I watched some people need to fully pull away, and I said, oh, there's a technique to this principle thing. You know, when you see the ensemble that you work with, going out, partying, having fun, blah, 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 not to fault them, because I wish I was in that position when I was on said notable gig last year. Um, but you see all of that, and you realize you have to step different as a principal. You have to take care of yourself in a different way. And so I knew going into that job, oh, I'm going to have to reserve myself. I'm highly introverted. I'm an empath. I feel things. I feel people's energies. I take it on whatever. And I have to play this person eight days, uh, eight days a week. Yeah, that's what it felt like. Eight shows a week, six days a week. Um, I had to also take on this role. So it was uh, wild trying to navigate that kind of pressure. And I don't think I figured it out until I left. Honestly, how yeah. to balance that that situation and so I took what I learned from that into my next um, gig which was a short contract that I loved and had the best time of my life because I was just like listen no one's gonna tell me how to, <laughs> how to do my job I got the job you can't tell me how to do the <laughs> you know what I mean like you can't tell me how to act as I do the job I'm You're, doing the job right right I'm doing the job um, but that's always something that stuck with me. I've seen that quote over the last few years that black women are not allowed to be introverts in the workplace. And I, it always resonated with me, but I never knew how to navigate it. And that's something that I just, I'm just learning. Yeah. And I'm so grateful, but it's so sad. Or, I mean, it, it, there is more strength in identifying that about myself than trying to put on this like facade of, Oh, I'm happy every single day. Yeah. Oh, I love every single person I work with. Oh, I love this job. So obviously I loved that job so much and appreciate it. was great for four. All of those things. But I did not have to show up into the workspace every day saying hello to every single person I walked by. Saying, you know, like it just was added work. It was added weight. It was added pressure. And sometimes we're just not in the mood for all that, you know, and I'm, I'm the 
most welcoming person, please come in, my door is open anytime. But I mean, just the pressure for black women specifically is wild, 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 wild. Yeah. Um, but the throes of my mental health journey were actually when I was in college and I was uh, dancing on the dance line for the marching band. So I like to say that uh, when Beyonce performed Love on Top at the end of Coachella, uh -huh. Beachella, um, she did Love on Top over a go-go beat with a marching band. And I'm like, that was created for me. Because <laughs> Love on Top is one of my favorite driving songs. I brought my car to New York and I definitely have been driving around New York blasting Love on Top. That and then the go-go beat, because I was born in D.C., raised in the area, went to school in D.C. Um, and go-go is just very essential to the area. And then the marching band behind her, because I was a band dancer for one year. <laughs> In college and I have a lot of feelings and a lot of thoughts about that experience mostly gratefulness that I did it and also because I grew up going to battle of the bands like that and going to like BT events with, with so marching cool. bands and like to, to not expect to do it in college and then kind of get tricked into doing it by my friends Keith and Colby I still want to fight it all uh, but it was just it was just a brilliant moment but I was going through so much that year that by the end of it my boundaries were fierce and they were up it was like x do xyz and i'm like i won't or uh this makes sense i'm like that doesn't and just i, I yeah I, I can't and then they were talking about like the next school year and i was like i'm a theater major if i'm casting a show i'm doing the show and i won't know until the cast list goes up in the fall so don't talk to me about next year right now i don't have yeah i'm like mm -hmm. um but the the throes of that i'm glad i navigated then because then uh the most difficult place to practice it was in Korea for Dream Girls. Um, because as I said earlier, uh, no one outside of your cast looks like you in the entire city. If they do, it's like a few teachers and military people here and there, some black expats. But Korea is overwhelmingly homogenous as far as the, the everyone's uh, nationality and mm -hmm. ethnicity. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a, a journey. And the fiercest part of my journey was in tech week and I, it got to a point where I just sat down with the director and I was like I will do this I won't do this I have this question answer the question you won't answer the question so I'm definitely not doing it like period we were talking about this recently that that even then you doing that was uh set an example for me and I mean at that time at that time we were both like still very it's, it's only a few years ago but it yeah. did it felt like we were both still very young and I had I, I guess worked a little more than you but yeah. Lexi was one of the youngest people in the cast and her like watching you just be like yeah no that's <laughs> that's the boundary that's no. the line it was it was wild to me because I just grew up um way more passive mm -hmm. and I knew that I had uh, opinions on things but I just thought the solution it's it's the dangerous trap of staying quiet yeah you know what I mean I just thought like why even bother why you know why just let them be crazy and ridiculous and why just you know let it go let it roll off your back um but it did it change all this so, people and watching you do that I mean it really it like held I was just like it was no an this is I, I learned from Professor Reggie Ray Howard University rest in peace he taught us the exact duties of everyone involved in putting in a production mm -hmm. so I feel like if you're not upholding your duties then I'm going to negotiate my duties with you, I will do mine fully. Yeah. But I will negotiate how you talk to me about mine because you're yeah. not good. No, no. I, so I, we love Seoul though. Like I would go, I would go back. It's good. Um, but the air quality was very dangerous for a lot of the cast, especially with such a song heavy show. It's almost, it's almost an operetta. It is an operetta. It is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's some through. Um, and so, so many people called out. Uh, that first week, we had four leads out leading up like in tech week and in dress rehearsals and so that meant that the covers had to go on but that meant the covers had to go on with no fittings really with no wig fittings with no quick change practice with no whatever so they were trying to rush through these things so that it was safe but i'm like so i haven't even had music rehearsals for i had like my i had like amethyst and, and, my, and my clear courts and shit in my bra but we have to sit in this for a second lexi monologued in the opera and it wasn't like I mean because the circumstances were so crazy and so extreme it wasn't like how dare she is an actor like that was none of our sentiment as a cast we were just like the balls question mark like 
it, but it was necessary. It, it was, was necessary. it was a wild because like, I also had to get to the rest of the show. I was like, I can yeah. harmonize. I can hit my part for this, but this moment here, yeah. if I do this, they're gonna have to drop the curtain. I was, I was like, a so hysterically moment. panicked at that time. It was just like I can get through the show if I just don't do this, and yeah. I already asked for no. So um, we did that, and then. The, the next day, thank God, Homegirl came back. None of the uglies were able to come back, but Homegirl came back. And I did the first show. It was two-show day. I did the first show. And then before the second, during the first show, I went into company management. I said, I have to call out the second show. I can't. I don't have, I don't have anything. Yeah. And I got, uh, I got on the subway at Jump Sill Station, which all the subway stations in Korea are entire malls. Entire malls. It's actually really cool. Um, and so I'm like, <laughs> get overheated because I'm like about to have a panic attack and like sweating and like hyperventilating I'm like I can calm down I can calm down just like get me out of the crowd there's no out of the crowd it's a subway station in Seoul so I like just tripped up the stairs and I was like fuck it I'm gonna sit down I'm gonna sit down <laughs> and I sat on the stairs inside the station it's just like taking deep breaths until it passed and think luckily one of my closest friends in the world was doing a trip around Asia and was landing in Seoul that night to visit me I was going to do the show and then meet uh, her at the hotel, but I was like, I'll just get home and, and take a nap before she gets here because if I get home and then she's there and this, I'm a fucking flip. I'm yeah. a flip. Um, and that having to check in with that mental, and also with with having to be honest about my mental health in that contract, that helped me a lot because I was so afraid to do that yeah. um, in college and yeah. even the years prior. And I scared a lot of people when 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 shit hit the fan and and my body was just like. No, and my mind was just like no. Um, but when I felt that starting to happen in Korea, I would I pick people. I pick like Candace, and I would like go to her room or whatever, and be like, I need to sit down. And I need to tell you that this is what's happening, and uh, I know what to do about it. But I need you to know that it's happening because I trust that if you see it happening, you'll check in. Um, <laughs> I was like, that's that's the story of how we got the same credit. <laughs> yeah, how we got the same credit. Yeah, her mama can sing, oh, but yeah. she wasn't singing that. There's a tight harmony. So yeah, so then Kayla had the cover thing. I'm grateful we were there. I'm grateful we had that experience. The show was beautiful. The show was gorgeous. I mean, it was we had beautiful. I just the same the same Korea corner, yeah. but the show was gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are not therapists, Yay. but we are actors who did those contracts. Hell yeah, and survived. Oh, Ooh. thank you. We are not therapists. Thank <laughs> you. I'm. Um, so excited for pull out no marking because yeah. as we're supposed to be, I'm passionate about mine. New York, I need you to stop with the fireworks. <laughs> I need you to stop with the fireworks. And at this point, I'm about to like write letters to the government because I believe the conspiracy theories. I believe the conspiracy theories, but the thing is like you, you <laughs> tell them about the conspiracy the theories and they want to send the police. I'm like, that's just not helping. It's not helping. It's not helping. And at this point, I almost believe that I just sound like a crazy person. But at this point, I almost believe that any noise happening outside of my window mm -hmm. is placed by the government. Like, I am like, when I hear uh, an ambulance siren go down, I'm like, they're just doing that shit to annoy me. Because at this point, I just feel like there is so much overstimulating sound outside my window. And we love the sounds of New York. Yeah. You know, like, I appreciate some uh, horns honking outside my window because that's me. I love Our neighbors and their parties seven days a week. If, if there's a, a couple outside fighting, I mean, Lexi and I will go. We actually have, almost went to go pop check on her, but then. Oh, yeah, there was a sweet, there was, uh, I, I assume she's sweet. I don't know this woman, but I just was watching this woman fight with her boyfriend, and so she got, she got left on a bench, and I, I went outside, and Lexi and I just kind of stalked around her while I held this little pack of tissues. So then she was on the but phone. But she was on the phone and I couldn't give it to her. <laughs> it, it was, we were really about to have it. You good, sis? I know, you good? Anyway, anyway. Um, any added sound these days just because the fireworks have been so out of control, so much so that I feel like I just need to exit the space next week. Um, I believe it are, are just planted there. It's yeah. an unreal amount of overstimulation that we are getting nightly, 8 p.m. to 5 p.m. And the other day, or 5 p.m. And, and the other day I woke up at, my alarm went off at 10.30. At 10.31, I heard a firecracker. I, it's just, it's, it's, you're on edge. <laughs> And anyone in New York knows, I don't have to tell you, we're on edge and it's working. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm on edge. Where are y'all getting these? That's why, that's also another thing. Because the fireworks are expensive. 
Yeah, well, Why there's so like, many. It's so funny. I got this. I get BuzzFeed notifications sent to my phone. And literally today, some BuzzFeed writer wrote, um, like, everyone saying the fireworks conspiracy theories, but really it's just, like, people being bored. And I'm like, okay, where where the fireworks come from? Like, where are these people? All of these people are bored two, three streets apart, and they're all getting fireworks from where? Like, it's like, it, it, there's such but a... But, like, not just little firecracker out the shack, I off mean, the highway. Are, I, I mean, mean, like, displays. So they are, and in, in, in Louisville, we have a very famous fireworks show called Thunder Over Louisville. These are Thunder Over Louisville fireworks. It's, it's out... In Harlem. Outrageous. I want you to insert a little clip here of the video we took yesterday, because, I mean, it's yeah. two streets over, and we are seeing... What on 4th of July would have been a lovely display of fireworks. <laughs> on June 23rd, that's an awful display. I mean, it's... Yeah, terrible. no, and if, I mean, if you want to Google the fireworks and conspiracy theories, is it interesting, because I'm not huge on that yeah. energy, but this, I believe, because also it's many major cities. I had for a friend in Chicago reach out when I did the video. I was like, yeah, here too. I got something from uh, Texas, something from Cali, and like Florida. Like, it's... Which... People are bored, and people do love fireworks and firecrackers in the summer, but yeah. it's just the, it's unreal. It's unreal. It's unreal. Yeah, and with that, I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm passionate about that. Oh, no, I have one more thing yeah. um, that I would like to speak on. Uh, speaking of Barcelona, uh, the woman who taught us how to say the word as young children, Keely Williams in Cheetah Girls 2, is asking for her coins. Please stream all three Cheetah Girls plus House Bunny because the royalties are better. <laughs> Strut like you mean it. If you, if you need to review which ones uh, have the best royalties, just go right to her Instagram bio. Sis, put it right there. <laughs> <laughs> I made my whole day yesterday. Yes. Thank you, Keely. Thank you, Keely. I'm literally, like, tonight going to stream Cheetah Girls 2 and just meet the sound. Oh, Strut like you mean And it. just, like, give her her coins. You better not mute Strut because that is a bop. She's got a baby to feed, and I'm going to make sure she feeds it. <laughs> <laughs> the support. We love to see it. Um, my full out no marking is actually, yuck, about uh, black women as patients in the healthcare industry. Oh, yeah. um, uh, black women are disproportionately um, negatively affected by practices and malpractices in the healthcare industry. Um, I saw you actually post something today. Uh, Kayla is an yeah, ambassador for Susan G. Komen. Um, and breast cancer research and, and fundraising. And uh, there was a statistic about how black women aren't disproportionately diagnosed. Uh, diagnosed. Like as far as numbers and population ratios are concerned, the diagnoses aren't disproportionate, but the, the treatment and recovery is. Yeah. Um, Forty the, the actual statistic is that 40% of black women die, 40% more black women die from breast cancer than white women, even though they are diagnosed at the exact same rate. Yeah. <laughs> and I was uh, speaking to a friend recently who was a doula, uh -huh. and just how passionate she is about uh, helping black women in childbirth because of how dangerous that is and can be. Um, and I, I have a close friend who recently went into surgery, but there's a pandemic and like, they don't live near a whole bunch of people they know, so they were like in the facility really by themselves. They didn't have like a friend to, to go with them or sit or take them home. And so our my friend and I on the other side of the country were like, give us updates, send us that like I said, wake me up, I don't care. Um, because they there it was a it was a reproductive system, it was fibroids. Mm. And she was just like, I don't want to go to bed and wake up and be infertile because that's a uh, thing yeah that would frequently happen to a black woman in, in that in yeah. that position um and then had to go back that evening like went home had to go back for emergency surgery and uh when i spoke with her the next day she was like you know i'm on the doctor's asses i'm saying these things i'm asking these questions but i'm so tired and i'm still a little bit under anesthesia and like i'm very uncomfortable because it's just a surgery and i i was like you know get your rest because you also need to be rested to heal and i was like uh as a, a daughter of two healthcare professionals um and daughters of four now i mean hey Hey, hey, wow, that's, that's how we ended up here. Hey, wow. Um, I, I told her, I 
said, you're, you're about to fall asleep right now, like go to sleep. I said, but make a note in your notes app about every question, comment, and concern you have so that when they come in your room and you wake up, you don't they don't leave or you don't get home. You're like, wait, I meant to ask or wait. No, no, no. Write every single thing, every detail out right now. Yeah. And I, I don't, I, it infuriates me that we have to babysit our uh, health care providers like that uh, because we're supposed to be focused on, on healing on and spending time with our bodies and spending time with our minds. And it's not that they'll, they'll uh, make a and some might, I don't know, but it's not that we're saying that healthcare providers are making a conscious effort to uh, give poor treatment to black patients, but there is poor treatment. Yeah, to and sometimes it's intentional. I saw a video today about a, a nurse, I think, out of Fort Wayne who was like, I don't like black people. And someone was like, so you don't think that has anything to do with when she sees a black patient? Right, right. What? Right. We shouldn't have to fight for ourselves the way we do but uh while we while we dismantle the things that make us have to do that please arm yourself with the knowledge and the confidence and the 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 wherewithal and the boldness to yeah. get your answers get your answers yeah because that's what they're there for prepare your voice especially yeah. like as you're going in just get your mind ready to be like okay i need to really cross it sucks yeah. but you have to be present in that moment you got to process in real time yeah. and make sure that you take care like every single question that pops up into your mind is okay to ask yeah. everything that you feel like you need is okay to say i need i mean that's the best space they are health care providers they need to care yeah. about providing health for you but there are patient advocates and if that person is helping you burn the place down i, I don't love know the place to go. i love that yeah um also while while we're there just to talk about Susan G. Komen really quick. I do. I am an ambassador for the Susan G. Komen Foundation, specifically the chapter that's here in New York City. And they are doing this Saturday their third annual Sisters for the Cure event, which I am living. I was, I was an ambassador all last year and I had no knowledge of the event. Uh, but I'm glad that this year it was brought to my attention and they asked, they actually asked me to perform at it this year, which is a side thing. But, um, if you are interested in at least learning from uh, educated black POC healthcare professionals, and they're holding like a brunch, a virtual brunch, which is so cute. Um, and on my personal Instagram, I'll be posting the story link uh, to the RSVP all week up until Saturday, and then just sign in, hear me sing, hear some people, some educated black people talk on it. It's going to be a great time. And that's Sisters for the Cure. It's this Saturday. Sign up via my Instagram. Yeah. Educated specifically in health and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, they have a whole team uh, on, on that website for the registration. They clearly explain their whole team. They're working with uh, CBS Air 2, I believe, and it's... Um, so they're going to have on their black newscasters, their black team, plus uh, a lot of healthcare providers that they've partnered with. And I'm going to be saying, yeah. Because education is relative, but we love specialists. We love specialists. We love information. We love it. Um, yeah. So we did that again. Oh, my God. That is the end of episode two of You Can Sis. I'm going to try to not squeal this week. Um, thank you guys for joining us yet again. Please, uh, if you feel like writing anything to us, Please feel free to send it to our email. It's yougoodsis at uh, yougoodsispod at gmail.com. Follow us on Instagram, yougoodsispod. Follow me and Lexi on Instagram. Uh, go to our Twitter, yougoodsispod. <laughs> Which I have actually been keeping up this week. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did make a typo on one of the tweets. I was like, I'm not redoing it as part of a thread. It's just going to have to be there. We're human. Yeah. We're human. Um, capitalize the B in black arrest and charge the officers and ex-officer because that was a massive move of help mm -hmm. um that killed brianna taylor um black lives matter black take care matter. of yourselves take naps black trans lives matter <laughs> and all that's all things. bye bye